I couldn't possibly summarize everything that we've said, so I'm going to give you a, some reflections in 10 minutes before we, we turn over to um, Canal and Ilka to, to thank everybody. And, and the way that I've, I've sort of thought about this is going back to the um, issue of you know, what faces, say, a minister or finance minister in a country. And, and basically, you can think that you know, successful countries um, maintain a focus on a long-term development vision, including climate. They maintain that focus over time, despite all of the economic shocks that come along. So economic shocks and political shocks and other types of shock, including now climate shocks, are, are part of life. But the, the, the countries that progress in terms of economic growth and poverty reduction and social improvement are in some ways the countries that, despite all that noise, maintain a rising trend. But of course, you know, it's the shocks that throw policy off course, that lead policy makers to engage in firefighting, including one of the issues that we've discussed here at this meeting around debt in all of its various um, forms. And of course, developing country policy makers have often the least ability to focus on the rising trend and the long-term vision in the face of shocks because of the structural weaknesses of their economies and their less uh, ample fiscal space. So there's a great um, American uh, philosopher uh, who summed all of this up, uh, Mike Tyson, the boxer. And Mike basically said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Right, that was Tyson's approach. And in some ways, that's what we see in our development discussion, discussions in this meeting, but the discussions that are going on all over the world as we come up to COP. We, we all have these great visions. We all have these great plans. We wanted to build back better after COVID. We wanted to achieve a just transition. We want to leave nobody behind. And these are all great visions. But what we have is a hesitant post-COVID recovery, notably in China, where the issue is not resolved. And what matters in China, of course, matters for the rest of the world, particularly the developing world, through commodity prices, trade, and finance. We have this terrible war in Ukraine which is now associated with a geopolitical fragmentation, which impedes international action and coordination. So history has certainly not ended. And we have global inflation and a tightening capital market, which in turn reduces some of the possibilities of finance that we have available. So those are sort of the, the Mike Tyson punches to the global economy and the global vision. We, we've said a lot in this meeting about tightening global credit markets associated with rising rates, uh, increasing spreads between developing country debt and advanced economy debt, capital markets drying up for probably at least half of the developing world, and if you've got uh, dollar-denominated floating rate debt, you are in a very vulnerable position as a result of dollar appreciation. And we don't really know how far the dollar will appreciate because it's still an unresolved question as to how far the Federal Reserve will tighten in the face of rising US inflation. And so all of this amounts to a decrease in fiscal space, including for domestic climate adaption and mitigation. And that's pretty hard because, as we've just heard in the very uh, thorough and uh, illuminating last presentation, uh, international action on climate finance remains a very weak and disappointing response. And so this is where the two big themes of this conference have come together, debt, associated with finance out on one side and climate finance and climate change on the other. 
and has given us the context for our very rich uh, and illuminating discussions over the last two days. So there's much to be pessimistic about. Um, I come from the north of England, so we're sort of predisposed to be pessimistic in the north of England. But I like to say that we're sort of cheerfully grumpy. And the world, you know, has been in this situation before and managed to crawl out of it. We had the 1980s debt crises, which were eventually resolved in a very messy way, but they were resolved. We had the Asian financial crisis in 98, which looked calamitous at the time, and we didn't know how far contagion would spread. We had the global financial crisis in 09-10, and again, we didn't know how severe the shock would be, particularly to the developing world. But again, we managed to emerge from that, perhaps in not the best ways possible, but the global economy did come out of that. And then finally, we've had COVID, which although, as I said, is unresolved in China, we've had the magnificence of science, which has delivered these vaccines, which has enabled us, through a global public good, to be present physically in this meeting today, rather than engaging with it on Zoom. So the conference has given us actual grounds for optimism, despite this pessimism. We've had some great ideas over our two days about how to try and sustain and build that longer term development vision, despite the shocks, to keep focused on climate, on poverty, on social improvement, despite the day-to-day -day business of finding the dollars, the debt service, for fiscal consolidation, uh, for, for whatever society also needs to do. So there is some ground for optimism for our Minister of Finance, despite the day-to-day -day difficulties uh, of life, particularly in the developing world. We've had ideas around greening capital markets, particularly the very rich discussion around green bonds, the conversion of uh, perhaps debt into equity, uh, for investment of uh, venture capital uh, and not just a reliance on bond finance. We've had discussion around the rise of economic, social and governance impact investing, uh, ESG, which can now take advantage of that development vision to bring private capital alongside uh, official development finance. And official development finance is often trying to leverage private capital, in ways that really do build and invest in that long-term vision. We've had some excellent ideas around development banks, the role of national development banks, a greater priority to those development banks in supporting the greening of economic strategy, of supporting a green or sustainable industrial policy and the investments associated with it. And we've had some particularly interesting ideas about what the fintech revolution might mean in the developing world, which gives us possibilities of achieving financial inclusion that we could never have dreamed about even, say, 10 years ago. So we're starting to move on the finance and poverty agenda in ways that are really truly imaginative and creative. So there's been much in this meeting to actually be optimistic about in terms of the generation of ideas. And I think this is the final note that I want to end on, which is to come back to Maureen from the Central Bank of Kenya, who made that very apt remark and response to my very difficult question about what one should do in situations like this by emphasizing the enormous resilience of people in the developing world, especially in Africa, um, their creativity in finding solutions in very different and difficult circumstances, their ability to pull together and to pull out of crises, despite often very meager resources, and to find solutions in what is a very tough world. And I think, you know, we can say modestly in this room over the last two days that the creativity of the people assembled coming from all kinds of different perspectives and backgrounds has at least provided um, 
ideas and initiatives that we can now take forward into larger forums such as the COP meetings about to start, into further meetings of international finance ministers, into the UN system itself, so that we can make progress in ways that we would all think would be apt and fitting for the modern world. So that basically is, is my conclusion from the meeting, and I'd like to ask uh, Kunal and Ilka to make a vote. Thanks. Thank you.